right, guys, thanks for coming. Uh, so this is kind of like our, present, uh, our presentation day. Uh, we have about 12 different presentations. Some of the teams couldn't make it, uh, so it's only going to be uh, it's only going to be videos from those teams. Uh, some of the teams will come in late. Some of the teams are early, so you know it's going to be a little bit up and down. But uh, I have to say, one of the one of the very, in, very very fun things about actually looking at all of these was the incredibly high quality of a lot of this a lot of the work that people have done in this uh, in this class in the project. So I'm I'm really quite impressed. I wanted to say that. Um, and the second thing is the incredible scope of things that uh, that have shown up. And uh, one of the one of the things our staffs tried to do when we met was to sort of uh, you know get uh, the best projects, uh, the best of breed projects in different fields. And so uh, kind of opened my mind too. Uh, so some of the things you might be able to do with this stuff, which I hadn't even ever thought of. So um, anyway, uh, let me not say too much, and we can just go on. So the first one here is from Team Taubman Insomniacs. Is anybody here from the team? Yeah, I figured not because they didn't respond on Piazza. Uh, so this is a prediction for policy making for predicting female labor force part of, uh, participation in Afghanistan. And let me play it. For our data science project, we develop a model to predict female labor force participation in Afghanistan to help the government design a policy to attract women to join the labor force. The U.S. government has been funding large projects aimed to empower women. USAID's new PROMOTE program aims to target 75,000 women with around 200 million U.S. dollars. Given the money spent, there has been no significant evidence that economic conditions for women have changed. Since the fall of the Taliban, labor force participation rates have been relatively constant. This could be because policy has not been addressing the right issues, or it may be that policy isn't targeting the right segment of the population. After compiling our data set, we look at correlations, focusing more on the highly correlated variables. We find that women who have been affected by violence in the past year are associated with a lower labor force participation rate, and women in regions with higher share of females who feel it is acceptable to be a CEO are associated with higher labor force participation rates. These descriptive statistics are quite revealing. It allows us to see that security and female perceptions appear to matter, and these may be some of the key policy levers to use. We also examine a range of prediction models, PCA, SVM, regression, random forest, and ensemble methods. Keeping in mind the potential cost of executing the program and the potential benefit of joining the labor force, we design a utility matrix that allows us to evaluate the various costs of classifying women. From the ROC curve and average utility analysis, we find that the logarithmic classifier is the best method of prediction. It has an accuracy of 81% and a high positive utility. Using our findings, we hope to help the Afghan government address this critical issue, and we hope to further explore the uses of prediction models to better design and tailor government policy programs. For our data science ah. project, we develop a model. That's what I was trying. Okay. So the next, uh, the next group here is the team, the deflators, uh, predicting offensive play calling in the NFL. I think some of the folks are here. Would you please come up? And I'll play the video. And then if there are any questions, they'll take the questions. Uh, and uh, what I would like you guys to actually, since you're here, talk about some of the challenges you had, uh, and but keep it short, like three or four minutes, uh, and then we'll just take some questions. Challenges you had, things you enjoyed doing in this, uh, what would you do more, stuff like that, you know, stuff that helps everybody. Okay, so let's go, oh, let's say yours, I have to actually, oh no, flash out of fade. Flash not that out of fate. Are you a defensive coordinator? Pictured as Rob Ryan, who started his NFL coaching career as a defensive coordinator of the Oakland Raiders and has ventured through two other NFL programs, four being five from the New Orleans Saints position earlier this season. Defensive coordinators like Rob Ryan are entrusted with numerous tasks, 
However, Rob's main challenge is definitely his plate calling responsibilities. This is no easy assignment as there are numerous offensive strategies, zone versus man, deep protect, blitz, 4-3, nickel, and dime packages. Another complication is that he also needs to base his decision on what the offense will do. This steal to the right shows a distribution of possible offensive plays, so it's not surprising that Rob asks for some help. After all, he may be taking a position with the Bills since his brother Rex is the Bills head coach. Our project analyzes data from the Pro Football Reference Play-by-Play -play account and generates classifiers to predict whether the offense will run or pass in a given game scenario. Rob is hoping that he can use our model to help him not get fired. Our model reaches out to his scores of 70.3%, although you would not be pleased with this score in exam, Rob has likely not been doing much better himself. An accepted baseline is 57%, the historical percent of pass plays from the 2003 through 2014 NFL season. We created seven classifiers and displayed a few interesting ones on this chart. We are showing the progression of our classifier's accuracy from 2003 to 2014. The most volatile is the SVM classifier, whereas the best performing model is our gradient boost classifier. However, the, the logistic lasso and random forest are not too far off. Imagine Rob standing on the sideline, not with his laminated white sheet, but with a Microsoft Surface 3. After all, it is the 21st century. And with this Surface, Rob has a real-time app that predicts whether the offense's next play is a run or pass. Our project makes this scenario feasible. If this were the case, he might be fortunate enough to become defensive coordinator of the Buffalo Bills. As expected, we were able to use passing tendency statistics for teams as well as play-specific details including down, distance, go, yard line, and scoring margin to quite accurately predict whether a team will pass or run on a given play. Given the sophistication of our classifiers, no model is perfect since only Malcolm Butler predicted pass on last year's Super Bowl winning play. So I guess we'll just talk a little bit about the challenge we face first. So uh, actually, most throughout the semester, I've, I've been working on uh, actually uh, Python package. It's on pip, if anyone wants to take a look. It's also on GitHub. Uh, it's called PFR. It's basically just used to, I, like, makes it easy to scrape, scrape NFL data from profootballreference.com, which has, like, basically any data you'd hope for. Um, so we use, the, we use that to scrape play-by-play -play data for every game from 2003 to 2014. Um, based on the tables that they have on there. And so I basically built that, scraped the raw data, um, and then from there we still had a lot of cleaning to do to get to where we wanted, but uh, Adam will talk a little bit more about that. So as with any data, you know, you run into issues. Um, we had to come up with a few workarounds. For example, if you're looking at football data, you kind of want to know which team has the ball. Unfortunately, Pro Football Reference doesn't have that, but they did have some IDs on the player that either ran the ball or received the ball on a pass. So Matt was able to scrape that, and we were able to use that, as well as some previous year data, because we had 2002 to 2014, as you saw. Our models only used 2003 to 2014, so we included 2002, and we were able to, able to come up with lagged data. So for example, um, passing tendency statistics, how often did a team pass um, last year, how often have they passed this year in previous games, how often have they passed in this game to say, okay, are they going to pass or run in this coming play? And uh, Stephen will talk about the models. Yeah, so using this data, we basically implemented seven classifiers. And as the video mentioned, our most accurate one was a gradient boost classifier, which gave us a test accuracy of 70.3%. Um, we're pretty happy with this result. Uh, I th we think that when you complement it with the defensive quarter's intuition of what's going to happen given this game scenario, that it could definitely elevate the performance of a defense. Um, and the most common features, or the most common features that uh, the most important ones were seconds elapsed uh, in the half, uh, as Adam said, the previous year's pass percentage for the team. Um, and then we also believe that the win probability uh, of that team at that moment was also fairly important. Um, yeah, I mean, if you guys have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Um, yeah, so one difficulty we had was evaluating our models because obviously, like, there's no data on, like, how successful actual defensive coordinators are predicting passes and runs. Uh, so a few, a few baselines we looked at were obviously, like, 50% randomly guessing. Can't really do worse than that because if you had a classifier that did worse than that, you would just invert all the, all the predictions and it would be better than 50%. Um, then we looked at baseline 57%. Uh, since over the data that we were looking at, that was the like fi like 57% of those passes were of those plays were passes. Uh, 
So if you were just guest pass all the time, you would get around 57%, and that number is going up. Um, so we viewed the extra 13% as like an uh, improvement over that baseline, uh, but it's hard to evaluate other than that. Uh, we also thought about um, basically like basically assigning costs to like because it's probably worse to predict a run as a or a, a pass as a run and then be wrong that way than the other way around. Uh, so we considered trying to implement some sort of cost for false positives versus false negatives, but it's kind of hard to quantify those those differences, even though they may be like somewhat intuitive. So we ended up just looking at accuracy. Yeah, so we looked at that. Um, it was pretty difficult to to predict like the individual um, like look like short pass like short pass right versus like short pass left, for example. It's like basically impossible to predict. Um, we we do have some like uh, visuals, uh, so like we can visualize those distributions. One of them was in the in the video, but we have some others on our website. Um, and it was also interesting to look at different teams and see how those uh, have like very differing distributions of sh like runs at the middle versus runs to the outside, stuff like that. So you can see those there. So that on the right is the full combined NFL. Then here in the middle, the Jet 09 Jets, very run heavy team. And then 13 Falcons, you can see all those short passes, like 60% of their plays were short passes. Um, but yeah. Um, we thought like for a future work uh, that we'd maybe try and develop a classifier that will not only predict just pass or run, but predict where their runner pass. Um, for instance, maybe the handedness of the quarterback or the running back would be a significant feature in that model. Um, however, like if we were to do this, like we'd also run into future issues with the data that we had. Uh, for some reason, Pro Football Reference didn't report like the rush direction in the detail section of the play-by-play -play data for the 2004 Pittsburgh season. So it's definitely something that we've considered. Uh, another thing you'll notice, uh, speaking of the handedness, is in the full data, 2003 to 14, on the right, that. There are more plays, uh, pass plays in particular, to the right side, which is probably because more quarterbacks are right-handed. So that was another thing that we looked into. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thank you. OK, so this, this team couldn't make it here. This is uh, nonetheless a really nice project. Let's watch it. As one of the most popular online news entities, the New York Times attracts thousands of unique visitors each day to its website. Users who visit the site can provide their thoughts and reactions to articles in the form of comments. A dedicated moderation staff can designate the most insightful comments as New York Times picks, and users can recommend comments that they like. There are around 9,000 submitted comments per day, over 60,000 unique contributors per month, and approximately 2 million comment recommendations, or likes, each month. Looking at comments more closely, we see that there are four comments per unique user on average, 24 recommendations per comment on average, 82 words in a comment on average, and that 3% of comments are chosen as New York Times picks. But what makes a comment good? What makes a user recommend a comment? We have studied whether we could predict a comment's performance. Let's assume that these comments here represent our random sampling of 186,000 comments over the last two years. If so, then 25% of them have at most one recommendation, 50% of them have at most five recommendations, and 75% of them have at most 16 recommendations. Thus, we decided to predict this region right here, comments that receive 16 or more recommendations. We carried out this prediction using a random forest classifier. We based our prediction on a variety of comment attributes, such as which words appear, total number of words, average word length, and the comment's quantified sentiment. The model then outputs whether or not it thinks a comment will receive 16 or more recommendations. In the end, our results were only OK. It turns out that you probably need more information to make a good prediction, but we still managed to achieve 98% precision and 75% accuracy in recall. So that was uh, predicting comments in the New York Times. As one of the most popular online news entities, the New York Times attracts thousands. 
Okay, then there was team boot like fireworks of which I believe we have some folks here. Please, please come here. And this was a rather interesting uh, idea, uh, predicting true love on ABC's The Bachelor. So I'll start it up and then we can have some, here is the. Can you predict love in real life? That's hard, but can you predict love on ABC's The Bachelor? Maybe that's doable. The premise of The Bachelor is simple. Each season, about 30 women compete to win the heart of America's most eligible bachelor, or at least the most eligible bachelor willing to find love on TV. Week by week, contestants flirt, date, backstab, and sob their ways towards an engagement ring, or even better, a spin-off TV show. Any contestant that does not receive a rose by the end of the week is eliminated. The goal of our project is to understand if we can predict week by week success for contestants on The Bachelor. We first focus on fundamental data for each contestant, namely, where they live in relation to The Bachelor, their age, and their profession. While we trust that a reality star would never fall in love based on looks, we also run a principal component analysis on each of the contestants' faces to serve as a proxy for their facial features. We then analyze competitive data, specifically if a contestant received a one-on-one -on -one or group date with The Bachelor in a previous episode. Finally, we pull Twitter by running a sentiment analysis for each contestant each week to gauge their favorability. We also look at the percentage of all tweets a contestant received per episode. Each week, we fit a unique set of classifiers to our data and test its accuracy for predicting who receives a rose. Although there is some weekly variability in our predictors, we find that the percentage of tweets a contestant received in the previous episode is a great predictor of success the following week. These results illuminate the producer's point of view. Reality television is just like narrative television. The biggest star gets the most screen time. The producers probably edit with the winner in mind, so a contestant's Twitter share most likely relates to total screen time and thus likelihood of survival. Why were the other predictors not as influential? One, The Bachelor has only been around for 19 seasons, so maybe in 2060, when we're watching Bachelor in Space, clearer patterns will emerge. Two, the show is set up so The Bachelor has only eight weeks to decide his future wife, so perhaps his choice is just a simple random process. Either way, tune in on January 4th for season 20 to see true love, or at least true data science, unfold. Hi guys, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, so yeah, as you saw, we did our project on trying to predict success of contestants in The Bachelor. Um, we made two kinds of predictive models. So the first model would be to uh, try to predict whether a given contestant would uh, advance past a particular round, a particular week of The Bachelor. Um, and then the second type of model was to pr try to predict whether a given contestant would win the whole thing. Um, and so as we mentioned, there were a lot of challenges uh, with this. Uh, of course, we didn't have, in terms of the data science class, we didn't have a lot of data. So we had 19 seasons and only about, uh, I think seasons 13 through 19 were easily accessible in all of the types of features that we were using. Um, so it was very difficult to go back in time and get tweets um, from you know, back 10 years ago. Um, as well as photos. Uh, let's see, so I think that that's one of our biggest challenges. Um, another thing was just simply running out of time. There's so much we could have done, particularly when it came to the PCA. You guys saw how kind of weird that principal component looked. <laughs> um, that's because when we scraped all of the images, they were all of different sizes and slightly different orientations, so we had to do some kind of a registration process on them. Now, generally that means doing a, uh, all types of transformations like rotations and scalings and translations, but we really only had time and computer power, <laughs> computational power for just translations. And so, unfortunately, that meant that our registration left a bit to be desired. Um, and so there was a lot of misalignment, and therefore the principal components weren't as meaningful as they probably could be given more time. Um, also, we'd like to look at different uh, features for the principal component analysis, including things like proportions in the face and hair color and other things like that, rather than just running this on the entire image itself. Um, but uh, other than that, I, we, we got to a lot of different kinds of features, which I thought was nice, including hometowns and, uh, and jobs and stuff like that. So thanks for coming. Questions? Yeah, uh, 
um, not not very good, <laughs> not very good. And I think that that had to do with uh, just the, the amount of data that we had. Um, one interesting thing was uh, that I think could improve the accuracy is incorporating that PCA kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it was, I think that with more time we could do better. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Clearly, I have no clue how to. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, so the next one was Team Nuns. So you want to win an Oscar? Come on over. Thank you. And I'll. Oh, I think this one is. Just, I'll actually play it on. Here, let me just hand, hand this over to you. So. Here. Let me just do it on, for the same reason that I did the football one on Chrome. Uh, home. All right, there we are. Hello, and welcome to the Movie Executives Handbook, a data science project by Team Nuns from Harvard University. The 20th century saw the rise of the movie as a unique storytelling device for mankind to share our collective experience and wisdom. The Academy Awards are considered by many to be the highest honor a movie can receive. Our work focuses on films already nominated and looks to predict whether they walk away with a coveted Oscar at the end of the night. IMDb's online database provides a wealth of information about individual movies ranging from the film's runtime to its cast. After combining this impressive data set with Oscar results over the last 20 years, we set out to determine what features most closely predicted a winner. To do so, we leveraged a range of machine learning techniques to build our predictive models. We hope all the directors watching this have their notepads out. Releasing a movie at the end of the year has a strong chance of being nominated, but the competitive landscapes make clinching a win that much harder. Movies would also benefit from keeping the gore factor to a minimum. Blood and violence don't particularly help a movie's chances, unless it's specifically about war. With that said, the parental rating of the movie has almost no bearing on its Oscar outcomes. And while winning an Oscar is quite the feat, most movie executives are more concerned with the final revenue brought in. With the help of our collected movie data, we set out to explore this financial success using linear regression modeling. The results range from the obvious to some that should give movie houses food for thought. For example, a movie's budget has little association with the revenue that the movie brings in. In fact, movies without any redeeming qualities or release strategy are expected to bring in 15 cents for every dollar spent. It might be a better idea to focus on the audience, with G-rated movies exhibiting much clearer successes than their PG-13 or R-rated cousins. To read more about the results and our methodology, we encourage you to visit our website and invite feedback, especially if you happen to be a movie producer. Hey guys, uh, we're one half of Team Nuns. We've gotten a few questions about the name. You'll notice that uh, early on in uh, project proposals, we were allowed to put none in the project name. We just decided to carry it forward. Um, so, so as you guys uh, saw, what we were mostly doing was uh, trying to predict movie success using either Oscar winning or box office sales as uh, our final metric, uh, most of the data, uh, and we spent a lot of time thinking about the data and how to acquire it uh, was the biggest challenge as well. It turns out that IM the IMDb database is pretty fantastic in terms of its depth and uh, breadth. The problem is it's too deep and too broad. Uh, so we spent a lot of time wrangling with that. Luckily, we found uh, a package, IMDb Pi, uh, that's open source, that's been created by a few enterprising folks out there uh, that makes calling the data a lot easier. Um, the thing, though, is it wasn't always in the format that we wanted. Uh, so we had to do a fair amount of work in the upfront, uh, transcribing things like, uh, you know, once you call a given movie, uh, how do you get its cast and how do you know things about its cast? Uh, as we move along. Um, and those are some of the challenges that we face sort of pretty early on. Uh, you know, Steve will talk about the model uh, in a little bit, uh, but uh, you know, in fact, maybe we just go straight into that right now and I'll just pull up the website. Yeah, so um, one of the, one of the, one half of our project uh, involved predicting Oscar success. And this is 
um, actually given that the movies are nominated, so the data set we used was the like a list of all the nominated movies that or all the movies that were ever nominated for Oscars. Um, and we wanted to keep it like feature because we figured that like movies that won Oscars back in like the 50s and 60s might have some different features than currently. So we restricted our data to like 1981 to the uh, 2006, which is the latest year we had the data for. Um, and so then um, what we did is uh, we built a couple different types of models. Our ultimate goal was predictive accuracy. Um, so we tested out like uh, different types of logistic regressions um, and SVMs and ultimately random forests was the best classifier. So um, could you comment a little bit about this plot? It was kind of interesting, yeah. the jitter and yeah, so plot stuff. this plot in particular, um, so in terms of dis uh, like decision, decision surfaces that we did, we didn't have a lot of um, continuous data, so like the only continuous things that we had were month and number of nominations, which kind of makes sense if a movie has more n nominations, it's more likely to, in general, win an Oscar. Um, so you can see that, um, like, and the x-axis is month, so as you go forward, um, there's more likely, or it's, it becomes more competitive in that, like, you need more nominations to be predicted to win. Um, if you are, have a large number of nominations in a later month. Um, and then, let's see, one of the other challenges we were working on um, was inc incorporating actors or the cast into the, um, our analysis. So we wanted to like create like a star power attribute for each movie, where basically if you have like someone like Leonardo DiCaprio, it's gonna benefit the movie, um, maybe make it a little bit more likely to win, but just the, like, the comp like we didn't have enough computational time and power to basically scrape all the cast for all the movies that we were looking at. Um, so that's something we could do going forward. Yeah, and just a quick word on the, the other analysis, which is the box office analysis, using very similar data, but combining, with, combining it with uh, other third-party data sources, such as revenues that we got from Box Office Mojo, uh, leverage a similar data set to basically use a standard OLS kind of regression to get at some uh, factors that are associated with better numbers. So Cool, thanks. Any questions? Uh, oh, the difference between the PG-13 and R-rated movies was n not really statistically significant, but they were both statistically significantly less than uh, PG, or G-rated, rather. Thanks, guys. Okay, the next team here. Okay, is team Bart Gates predicting college admissions? And I'll play the video. And if you guys could demo the website afterwards. Sure. That would be fabulous. Hi, my name is Morgan. I'm 16 years old. I'm currently a junior in high school. I think my current list of colleges to apply to is Sixteen schools or something. Everyone knows you have to have a good SAT score, good GPA. That's obvious. But then once you're in kind of that top tier of students, it's really unclear like what allows someone to get into Harvard, um, and, and why do some people get into Harvard not, but not Princeton and not Yale? For someone like me, I mean, I love math. I like numbers and logic, and it just seems like there should some data on this, but there's really nothing available to us. Oh, wow. I don't know if that's higher or lower than I expected. If we look at this table of importances in, in the model, it really does look like ACT and SAT are the most important in determining college admissions, way more so than other things like sports. So what if I boosted my ACT score? Wow, that really did help a lot. We can also look at how some of the different application pieces work together. So we can look at how GPA is split out by people who apply early or not. And it does look like people who apply early have higher GPAs on average and seem to get in more. 
going to take a closer look at the data, uh, we can see that Harvard has 50-50 gender split, but Stanford only has 43% females, which is pretty troublesome to me. I'm going to take a look a little bit more closely at how SAT is related to gender in these two schools. And uh, we do see that the SAT scores for uh, males and females who get into Harvard are about the same, but it's actually higher for females getting into Stanford. So it's harder for females to get into Stanford. So you can tell by the swag I'm wearing that I'm part of Team Ivy. Um, as a parent who just sent two kids off to college, I can tell you that the college admissions process is very opaque in this country. Uh, and you spend an enormous amount of time trying to figure out what the, um, what the schools are really looking for and where to spend your time and resources. So one of our goals in the project very early was to uh, be able to find the, um, the reasons why one person gets into a school and doesn't get into another school. Um, and make that very clear so that people, so uh, students and parents can choose their time wisely. Because we had these ambitious goals of not only building the predictive model, but also the uh, explanations and a public website that lets people play with it, um, we had to do a lot of things in parallel. So one of the things we had to do early on was um, create this database class that allowed us to generate mock data. And that way, uh, with that, we could work on the classifiers completely independently from the ADA, completely independently from the website. Um, so that was a, a really key, th uh, key challenge that we had, and, and that's how we overcome that challenge. Um, we also uh, had a couple of different sources for scraping data. Um, one was um, uh, textual data from uh, college discussion boards, which was very rich, but very hard to parse. So Lauren found an excellent site that had a lot of uh, rich um, structured data, and I'll turn it over to her and she'll talk about that. Um, so the second website that we tried, which was a lot better, was collegedata.com. The data is very structured, but a problem we ran into there is that the actual data was generated by JavaScript, so it, we couldn't just use the requests get method to, to get the data from the HTML. We had to use um, this uh, Qt, um, a Qt um, method that helps you load the data before you um, generate the HTML that actually contains it. Um, if you ever run into this problem, you should go to our notebook because, um, well, the source where we got it from is here. So um, then everything went very smoothly and then we got this, um, we got data for about 5,000 students, I think. Um, and in total we had um, yeah, this is really small. So about 5,000 students um, and in total 16,000 applications. Um, so let's look at our explanatory d data analysis. Um, we have a lot of indicators in our data set like female or male, uh, early application or not. So first thing we did was, um, as you saw in our video, we plotted some percentages um, for every university so that you can spot some initial obvious discrepancies. Um, we also compared um, the scores, uh, mostly SAT scores, for minorities or non-minorities or males or females to see if you need like a higher score to get into certain colleges. And you can play with it here, like um, pick the colleges that you would like to know the answer for. And um, you see that um, first there's a big difference. Um, there, there are large differences between the colleges. Um, definitely interesting to look at. Uh, for the classification, we started from a baseline of 61%, um, which is when we predict that no one is getting into college. Um, and then we were able to Im improve this to 74% with a random forest classifier. So we, we tried K-nearest K neighbors, SVM, logistic, and we ended up using the random forest because it was the best. Um, here you can see our ROC curve um, that shows that we add a boost yeah, okay, so that's me. This is the ROC curve, let's. Okay, so as part of this, we built an interactive website that you saw on the, uh, on the video. Um, so the point of it is a random student can uh, go on the website and, uh, and enter what their details are, and then uh, basically cho choose which of the, so we did it for the, um, the top 25 colleges in America, and then so you say, I want to get into here, and then so it gives you some prediction that you'll get in. And then the idea is that if you play with some factors or if you try and increase your SATs from 
a solid 1200 to maybe a slightly better score, it should increase your chances of getting it. guys. Yeah. Thank you. I was quite impressed that there's a, there's a working website with all of this in, in there as well. So and hopefully you guys can get more data and I can actually see a big use for this. Okay, so that was your one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is Team Mavericks, uh, taxi prediction. I'm trying out a new, uh, a new presentation software, so I'm not quite got it. Okay. Yellow taxi cabs are an international icon of New York City. Responsible for 200 million trips a year, taxis bring people all over the city day and night. Over 100 gigabytes of trip data with a record for every taxi ride since 2009 is publicly available. In our project, we use data from yellow and green cabs between January 2013 and May 2015. When we first explored the data, we recognized that particular days had unusual pickup distributions. We hypothesized that weather and other factors could be predictors for these phenomena. We set out to predict the number of pickups in each location at a given date and time in the future. This would help taxi companies improve the coverage of their fleet, become more efficient, and anticipate surges and drops in demand due to weather and other factors. To clean and aggregate the data in a timely manner, we use Spark to distribute the work on a cluster. To generate useful features, we discretize time and location into bins. We performed predictions in two different ways. First, we predicted the pickup density for each half hour of each day in an average week. We tested a cane nearest neighbor's regressor and a random forest regressor. We found that a random forest consisting of 200 deep trees was most effective. This model explains over 95% of the variability in the number of pickups. Cab companies could use this type of prediction for developing long-term policies for improved taxi distribution. The second, more challenging approach involved keeping data of each specific day separate from other days. We then split the data into two groups, pre-2015 data and 2015 data. Using past trip and weather data, we predicted the pickup density distribution for dates in the future. A taxi company could use this type of prediction on a daily basis to tune their policies based on weather or other factors to maximize coverage on a specific day. However, the noise in the data became more apparent when we used this fine-grained temporal granularity, and the prediction accuracy decreased. We have some ideas for continuing to improve this model. We could adjust the data preparation so that information about locations without any pickups is fed into the model as well. Right now, our model receives no data about the number of pickups in these locations and therefore thinks that the number of pickups is unknown. However, the absence of records at such locations means that there were zero rides. Training a model with that knowledge would lead to more accurate predictions. For more information, please check out our website and GitHub repository. Okay, so... So I can pull up the website. Yeah. So as mentioned, we were... Uh, trying to predict the distribution of taxis in New York at any given location in time. And uh, all this data is publicly available. It's posted by New York City online. And we selected years uh, 2013 through 2015 to use. And so we had three different approaches for trying to predict the taxi distribution. Uh, one approach, as said in the video, was was uh, to predict for an average week. So there, uh, we aggregated the data in over the course of seven days. We would predict uh, on an average Monday what the distribution would be. Um, and as said, this is something that taxi companies could use for kind of long-term uh, pattern analysis and trying to distribute their taxes in the most effective way to maximize profits. Uh, the second uh, approach we had for prediction was trying to predict for a particular day. So here, instead of aggregating the data just into seven days, we use all 365 days in the year, as it kind of makes sense that there could be different patterns on, say, a Monday in December than a Monday in July. Um, we also incorporated weather into this prediction model, and uh, we have a list of feature importance here as uh, ranked by our random forest regressor. And you can see location is very important. 
Uh, some of our time features are important. And from the weather, average wind speed turned out to be most important. Um, we, we tried a random forest and a cane nearest neighbor's regressor, and the random forest was more accurate. Um, and so the third approach was taking a pickup location in time, can we predict the drop-off location? Can we predict the destination? And that's really hard to do. Um, our R squared was like 0.06 or something. It's just they can go anywhere in the city pretty much. But we uh, created an interesting visualization using that where f using the pickup location and time, you can uh, predict the distribution of possible drop-offs. Um, I would say in the project, the greatest challenge was probably working with the data. Uh, so for the two years that we downloaded, I guess 2013, 2014, and the beginning of 2015, we had about 70 gigabytes of data, and each time we wanted to try to aggregate in a different way, we had to use uh, a cluster and distribute the work using Spark, so that definitely added some complexity. But yeah, any questions? Yes. Uh, so I'm not exactly sure how to answer that. Our, the R squared for our initial model for an average week was around uh, 0.95. So uh, you can predict that with fairly small error. Um, yeah, can you be more specific? Uh, I do not know the p-values offhand. Yes. So, can you repeat the question as well? Uh, he asked, how do we actually divide the work up on Spark? And so, um, basically, we had uh, about 400 million records. And so, if we were trying to, let's say, discretize location, we're taking the, for each record, uh, the longitude and latitude coordinates, and we're uh, discretizing it into some block. The way we did it was using geohashes to come up with a grid system. But you can see that you can easily just partition the data on Spark into different chunks, and each worker can kind of discretize a record. Yep. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, so this is just a video. Um, this is a, uh, the, the, the cool thing about this project is it's a single person project, which is, I thought, quite impressive. And it's uh, trying to predict drug treatment uh, program uh, adherence. Uh, the person's in South America, so therefore they're clearly not here. Uh, let's watch it. How to effectively treat drug abusers is a controversial and timely issue in the United States. In the last 15 years, many convicted drug users have been required to complete a drug treatment program instead of serving time in prison. Completing treatment instead of spending time in jail has many psychological, financial, and social benefits. The question is, are these programs helping drug users lead productive lives? And who is likely to succeed in these programs and who isn't? Having answers to these questions could lead to better tailored treatment and better use of resources. The data includes demographic, geographic, drug use history and treatment program outcome information for approximately 9.8 million treatment episodes in all 50 states between the years of 2006 and 2011. Our objectives for this analysis are to predict the probability of completion of treatment and to understand the drivers of successful drug treatment. Jane is a 32-year-old Hispanic woman with an eighth grade education. She's from Illinois and abuses pain medication. She entered an an intensive outpatient drug treatment program. What is Jane's probability of completion? To answer these questions, we explored the correlation between individual characteristics and treatment outcome. A few factors stood out. High variance in state success rates. Success rate increases with increasing age, whereas other factors did not play a large role, such as gender. Relevant features were used in the development of three predictive algorithms, random forest classifiers, logistic regression, and gradient boosted trees. And finally, the three models were combined into an ensemble predictor using logistic regression. The gradient boosted trees model had the greatest accuracy. Let's come back to Jane. The ensemble method predicted a probability of success of 5%, and in fact, she did not completely success, she did not successfully complete the program. The identification of at-risk participants such as Jane can help improve her treatment as well as improve resource management. 
The predictive accuracy of the model could be improved through more feature engineering. New features could include access to stable housing and family support structures, as well as treatment program specifics and details on treatment providers. Okay, the next, uh, the next team is the Real Bogus Classifier team. The Real Bogus Detection Classifier for Band Stars Astronomical Data. I'll play the video. Here's the mic. And the interesting thing about this team is that they have new results on even a larger set of data, which they will show us today as well. Although the Chelyabinsk events impact or caused no fatalities, many people were injured and the damage would have been much worse if the impact were larger. The PANSTAR survey is part of an international effort to discover and track near-Earth asteroids in order to accurately predict future impacts. Each exposure from the PANSTAR's one gigapixel camera generates roughly 100,000 detections over its 60 detectors. Most of those detections coincide with an astronomical source and are known to be real. Another large fraction of those detections occur in damaged regions of the camera and are known to be false, but roughly 10% of the detections cannot be immediately classified as real or false. It is those detections that we're focused on. Each detection comes with a number of features, such as position, brightness, or shape. In most cases, these characteristics are similar to real and false detections, but some are key distinguishing features. With the exception of SVM, all of our classifiers have accuracy above 80%. The best classifier is gradient boosting. Thankfully, gradient boosting also has the highest amount of area under its ROC curve, which means it's also the best at minimizing false negatives. We've also devised a custom profit function based on expected asteroid discovery yield, which can guide future survey choices, such as cadence and filter. This type of classifier will be critical in future asteroid surveys that will generate orders of magnitude more data, such as the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. So, uh, um, as we said in the, in the video, our goal is to um, take astronomical data from the PANSTARS-1 telescope and try to separate the detections into real and bogus uh, detections. Uh, this is really important because the downstream modeling depends not only on the accuracy within a single exposure, but it's, it's actually exponential. You might require several exposures and uh, it is, uh, the computational load is, uh, the, it depends upon your uh, accuracy to the, the number of exposures involved. So if you need six or eight exposures to make a detection of a moving object, improving your accuracy on, on the single exposure level has uh, great advantages. We've continued our work uh, and to try to refine our, our classification method to not only improve the accuracy, but also to minimize the false positive or false negative rate, which is, you know, the rate of here's a real object that we misclassify as false. So, um, so, so I want to do, um, looking through the data a little bit to get, because I'll tell you a lot about what the next steps are um, to improving this, this project. Um, and I just want to say that one area that I think could have improved is the messaging. Something that we did not wait enough is really the benefits of, of this project downstream. So if you look at the data, um, as, as Matthew mentioned, this is a physical thing. There are physical detectors, um, 60 of them. For example, the edges are known to have a lot of false detections. Um, we can classify whether they're close to a known object. Um, but some of them are stationary objects and some of them are moving objects. There are also five different wavelength bands that are used to find these objects. This is the Z band, for example. Um, you, they have several features. There are actually 61 potential features that we could have looked at. Um, some of them have clear divisions and some of them don't. And so 
some of the things that we have done recently is we have a different classifier now for all five bands, but something that might all be interesting, for example, would be to also create a different classifier for moving and stationary objects. Um, they may have different profiles. Um, and if you look at the results, um, you know, it's, you end up seeing gradient boosting being extremely dominant. Um, as, I, as the video showed, the stakes of this is that the objects that were miss that you know you throw out are potential asteroids that could hit Earth and kill people and cause millions of dollars in property damage, um, and so accuracy is not the only thing that we're looking for. We're also looking for um, minimizing false negatives, um, and with that, we ended up running it um, on the pass that we managed to get um, for the project. Forty-two percent were accurate, and. Uh, could you talk a little bit about this profit function while I show the newest results? Yeah, so that, that was the, the, the cuts and profit function that uh, was mentioned in the, in the video. And really, that's, that's an unusual thing because in order to identify a moving object, you need to see it in several images and be able to uh, see that it's moving basically in a straight line con in constant motion. And so it end up, ends up being curiously uh, a function that depends not only upon the, uh, the precision but also the recall. Because uh, it, it depends sort of, you know, if you sort of write down um, uh, the, the detection rate, it will depend upon the area covered and the probability that you make each detection, and there's a, a binomial in there. So really, as you, you, make, the, you make a plot of this, uh, if you say your cost function is the expected number of discoveries you make, and you're trying to uh, maximize that at constant computational resources and constant telescopic resources, there's a uh, clear maximum at how many objects you should accept. As you go up the ROC uh, curve, you're improving your true positive rate, but you're also at some point increasing your false positive uh, rate, and that starts to bog down your calculation. And these are the newer? Yeah, these, are the, these are the latest results. And so if you look on the left, though that's every detection in an exposure. That's roughly 100,000 uh, detections. And as, as we go through our classification and, our, and everything we've learned in the project, you boil it down to what's on the right. So what's left are the things that we cannot account for through our procedure. And that's what's really amazing is because we're, we're left with uh, really just a, a few percent of things that we can't either say line up with a known star or is clearly a false positive. And so these are the ones we follow up or? These are, that, that's, that's what goes into the downstream calculation. Okay. Okay. So you'll take the results of that six or eight uh, exposures and connect those dots. And it's much more effective than connecting the dots on the left. Cool. Any other questions? Thanks, guys. Okay, so this is Team MYM, Topic Modeling with Supreme Court Cases. Ah, you guys are here. Cool. And I'll get the video going. <coughs> Here's the. Every year in the United States, hundreds of courts decide thousands of cases. These courts range from local courts to appeals courts all the way to the Supreme Court. Lawyers use these decisions to do research and to write legal briefs. Yet with so many cases in the American legal canon, Doing research is difficult. Where can a tax lawyer, for example, find a list of all court decisions on tax law? Our project takes a stab at helping lawyers in this process. Using the text of all Supreme Court syllabi, summaries of decisions, since 1946, and using pre-assigned issue areas from a legal database, we classify Supreme Court cases into 14 issue areas. We convert the syllabi into corpuses, lists of all the words in each case and their frequencies, split up by part of speech. We train a number of models, both supervised and unsupervised, on our corpus data. With a vocabulary size up to 20,000 words, our models must reduce dimensionality. And the two most successful models are ultimately both supervised, naive Bayes and a linear support vector machine. The support vector machine achieved an accuracy score of about 76%. This heat map shows the overlap between actual and predicted results. The dark diagonal shows that the SVM had good results. In addition, the darkest spaces not along the diagonal, such as the overlap between federalism and economic activity, 
makes sense. These are issue areas with lots of overlap in terms of legal substance. The naive Bayes classifier tells us what words are most associated with different issue areas, and it yields very interesting results. For example, the words equal, protection, rights, and 14th are all associated with civil rights, just as we would expect. To apply this project, we would want to apply our models to classify non-Supreme Court cases, such as appeals court cases. This would assist lawyers in searching the large set of court opinions issued by other courts. To improve our model, we would consider using other features, such as the location of the case, in addition to words. So I'm Max, and I just want to briefly talk a little bit more about the motivation for this project. Some of you may have seen, about a month ago, there was an article in the New York Times about how the Harvard Law Library is in the process of uh, basically making all of its records, all of its legal books and legal cases electronic, which is really good uh, because legal resources and legal research costs a lot of money. And especially for public interest lawyers, like public defense lawyers uh, and things like that, it's very, very expensive uh, to do the legal research that they need to be effective. Uh, and with all of this new data coming out, it'll be useful if we can do things like what we do in our project to try to classify that data effectively. Uh, because, you know, as we know from this class, just having data isn't enough. We want to try to make it useful for lawyers. Uh, and so that's sort of the goal uh, in this project. I'll let Yunhan talk a bit about our data collection. Um, so we use two main sources of data. Our validation data came from a nice, clean CSV by the Supreme Court database. And then for our text data, our initial plan was to use the Court Listener API, which is a legal service that's pretty good at uh, giving you opinions for, uh, it's comprehensive, but we ran into two problems quickly. The first was that the size of the data was just too big. Um, for reference, some of the Supreme Court opinions are hundreds of pages. The Citizens United opinion was, I think, 183 pages, which is 48,000 words, so that would kind of make analysis intractable. Um, the second issue was a missing data problem. Um, a lot of the uh, data from the court listener API had missing fields, so it'd be really hard to join to our validation data. So we pivoted instead to scraping data from Justia, which is a browsable um, repository of uh, syllabi, and we used instead of opinions, legal syllabi, which are, is kind of like the abstract of each um, opinion in that it offers a summary of the legal facts and opinions, or the arguments of the case. Um, and then, yeah, that's Cool. <laughs> we, we can navigate on here. Yeah, yeah, just, there should be a web, web player somewhere. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, okay, yeah, so, so ultimately the two okay. best models we had were, um, as Max mentioned, or as we mentioned in the video, um, the best was a naive Bayes classifier, and the second best was a linear SVM. Um, so basically, there are a couple of like nice, convenient ways to visualize the results. Um, the first was a heat map that was displayed in the video that's about to be pulled up. So basically, we divided everything into 14 topic areas. Once again, these are areas defined by the Supreme Court database data. And this basically shows the intersection of each topic area that's predicted versus the actual topic area. Um, so for example, if you look at like um, the first row in the third column, the 0.22 means that, um, or fourth column. The 0.22 means that 22% of due process cases get classified incorrectly as criminal procedure. And this is with the SVM classifier. Um, so this is interesting both in that the main diagonal of this matrix shows a relatively high level of accuracy, but also that the darker off diagonal entries shows us where um, the most common mistakes were. For example, the one I just mentioned, things like federalism and economic activity. Um, and similarly for naive Bayes, uh, we were able to get a list of words that were important for each category. And these were actually you know, fairly intuitively reasonable. For, exa for example, if you look at federalism, you get things like state, Congress, federal, power, and authority, which are exactly what you would intuitively think of as reasonable for federalism. Um, this is also useful in that it correlates with the heat map fairly well. For example, we saw that due process and civil rights often get misclassified as each other. And you can see that words like 14th, referring to the 14th Amendment, show up as pivotal words for both of those categories, which implies that it's not just a sort of random error of SVM, but rather that it's a systematic similarity that's difficult to deal with. Really 
beautiful. Uh, and the visualizations that they have. So we all became uh, members of that service before approaching this just to see what they were Every up to. Every <laughs> year in the United States. Go ahead, sorry. Uh, and uh, it's very impressive. I think they have um, all Supreme Court cases, most like state court cases in there and have very useful visualizations for uh, lawyers who are doing legal research. Uh, yeah. I think the main problem right now is just digitizing all of the data. Uh, that's been a big challenge to surmount. So now that that's done, there's like a lot of other companies who are pursuing kind of the same thing. Ravel is really, really great. So. Any other questions? Well, thanks, guys. Okay, we have. Uh, so there were a whole bunch, of, there were actually three different projects which were trying to predict startup funding via different things. One via Reddit comments, one via Twitter, and one using a whole bunch of other features. Uh, all of them actually were quite good. And so we kind of randomly chose, uh, uh, chose uh, between them. And so this is, this is the first kind of like business one that I, I thought that we should have at least one. Venture capitalism is one of the last frontiers of finance untouched by data-driven analysis. We wish to investigate whether social media data may be used to quantitatively predict a startup's success. In particular, we want to use Twitter data, a rich database of public sentiment and interest, to forecast the amount raised in startups' venture rounds. We scraped 387,000 tweets mentioning one of 3,200 startups, a funding data source from AngelList. After translating the non-English tweets via Microsoft Translator, we use natural language processing to parse and lemmatize words, and we use sentiment analysis with censored WordNet to validate the positivity and negativity of tweets for each company. We also extracted features from Twitter metadata, like number of favorites, retweets, links, tags, average tweets per day, et cetera, as well as features developed investment round, like series type and company type. We used over 40 features in total. Principal component analysis showed us that three of our features explain 95% of the variance, and the top five features explain 98%. The most important features seem to be number of favorites and retweets and the date range to the last 200 tweets. The average funding round raised $10 million, which we use as a flat baseline prediction. We normalize the funding amount by log transformation, and we normalize the rest of the numerical features using a box cox transformation. For predictive modeling, we use cross-validation of three classes of models. One, regularized linear regression. Two, support vector regression. And three, neural nets. Overall, each of our models did better than our baseline predictions. In particular, SVR with a radio basis function kernel performed best, followed by SVR with a linear kernel and then ridge and lasso regression. In the future, we would perform more clustering to obtain more tailored forecasts with regard to company sizes and industries and combine Twitter with other signals to achieve better predictions of funding success. We have at least one member of the team here, right? Oh, we have two. Fabulous. There's the... Yeah, this is the last one. Yeah. Um, so we were, motiva we were motivated to um, explore startups because unlike other branches of finance, which have been um, ver become very quantitative in recent years, for example, hedge funds have become um, very... Um, um, driven by quantitative um, trading, venture capitalism has been relatively untouched by data-driven analysis, and a lot of venture capitalists um, rely on subjective and um, kind of experience-based um, kind of um, opinions to make investment choices. Uh, and we wanted to see if we could make quantitative um, predictions for investments. Um, so one of the problems that we ran into was that um, a lot of funding data was very sparse, and Crunchbase, which has the most extensive um, database of funding data, had a lot of anti-scraping software. So we used AngelList instead, and we scraped it using Erlib2 and Beautiful Soup. We also ran into some data collection issues with regards to Twitter. Twitter has a uh, search API that lets you s scrape all the mentions of a particular company but unfortunately only reaches within the last six to nine days, which isn't a lot of tweets. So we had to manually scrape that using Selenium WebDriver. We also uh, wanted to make sure we could use all our tweets. Um, the majority of our tweets, something like 209,000 or so. Yeah, like 60% of our tweets were actually non-English. 
So to run them through the sentiment analysis, we had to translate them via Microsoft Translator. That was a fun episode. Uh, my, fun fact, Microsoft Translator actually has a limit on its free tier. It's 2 million characters. And we had something like 387,000 tweets. So we had to use a lot of accounts to get around this. <laughs> Um, one other um, issue that we had to deal with was that um, ideally we would use um, valuation data um, as our response or like our VI variable, but that was not, that data is not available. So instead we use amount raised per investment round as a proxy. Um, so as you saw in our video, we used three models with um, k fold cross validation, um, SVR, regularized linear regression, and neural nets. And we found that we could find um, like a signal that was much better than baseline. However, um, in terms of R squared, it was still a relatively poor predictor on its own, but we hope that it could be combined with other signals to get a better response. Um, um, another thing that um, we would prefer to do in the future would be to do, or cluster, okay. Um, to do more clustering um, and be able to um, kind of get more tailored um, predictions based on features of the startup. Cool, thanks. Uh, any questions, folks? No? Okay, so now hold on here for a second. They're going to go and figure out which they thought was the best presentation. I have no clue what they're coming up with. And there's chocolate for the winners. Uh, meanwhile, I can probably, let's see, I had a few more, but I think we probably need to stop over here. But let me actually just uh, talk about them a little bit. So there's actually one more, which is a uh, long video, uh, big data for small viruses. You know what I'll just do? I'll just, uh, I'll just play the video while there. We won't consider this in the. Uh, Venture capitalism uh, is one of the last frontiers of. Apparently, I can't do this. So this is a slightly on the longer side video, but uh, since they're not able to be here. How does your body respond to a viral infection? You may have heard of B and T cells, but that's far from the whole story. In fact, most of the cells in your body will undergo some sort of cellular response to make it harder for a virus to infect them. You guys, and if the virus oh, infects back. them, okay. make it so they produce <laughs> less of that virus. So we have to stop the <clears> entertainment <throat> for now? Then, uh, huh? Oh, go ahead. Here's the mic. All right, so the judges have spoken. <laughs> so we had a very intense but unanimous decision <laughs> and discussion. Um, and I think um, Verena is going to announce the runner-ups first, and then we're going to announce the winner. And by the way, we should mention, this is purely based on the presentation today, and it has no implications for your grade, OK? So this is just for fun. But you do get real chocolate. So. <laughs> Yeah, I also want to emphasize again, really, really cool project. I was impressed. The only thing that puzzles me, it seems that nobody could get an SVM to work. Like everywhere there's like gradient boosting, random forest, and then there's the SVM doing significantly worse than everybody else. <laughs> I think that is a, a thing of the time limit and SVMs being really hard um, to train. Anyways, so our number th third prize third prize category is the bachelor project. Pretty. <laughs> what? She ran off? <laughs> um, right, the well, oh. We have chocolate. Does anybody have <laughs> who, who knows her? What? Does anybody know that? You do? Marginally. Marginally. <laughs> 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 so, of course, all the projects were really great. What we particularly liked was that they combined the different data sources. Like, they were one of the few projects that actually had image data and textual analysis. So, the second place goes to the taxi prediction project.
<laughs> very clear design, very cool range of methods, big data, usage of Spark, Spark, really cool showing off of what you all learned in class. And then the first prize goes to the college application. <laughs> So we hope that your website is going to have a lot of visitors in the future being very useful. I love the interactive visualization. So yeah, that's it. That's it, and thanks again. Everybody did a, everybody did a great job uh, from what we saw today. So thanks again. You've been a great class. Thank you. Thanks, guys. And a great and break. <laughs> and it's quite clear that a lot of you are already on the way to becoming those unicorns we talked about right at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> so that's